Hey everyone, I'm Matt and I'm here with Ryan to talk about our 6881 final project for intelligent robot manipulation. Our project is on robotic juggling. This is shown up in the top here. And as you can see, it's pretty much the equivalent of juggling a ping pong ball with a paddle. So what we'll be doing is talking you through the different steps that we took to drive the system and how robust the system is to perturbations in the ball position. So like I said, what we wanna do is juggle this ball with the paddle. So this is hitting the ball up and down repeatedly, but the key here is we wanna do this stably. Uh, so when doing this, there's a few questions we wanna think of first. First, what is our physical setup? This means what inputs do we need to create the control for this? Uh, what are the parameters of our ball, our paddle, et cetera? Further, how do we track the ball? So of course, as you might imagine, the first thing you wanna do to juggle something is you wanna be able to track it as it's falling, uh, to be able to hit it back up in the air. Further, we wanna be able to orient the paddle to create a stable juggle. And the way we can create a stable juggle is by defining some axis where we want to juggle the ball on. And we orient the paddle to get the ball to juggle vertically along this axis. Lastly, any environment where there are collisions in this manner, uh, there is a lot of dynamic things happening. So how can we constrain some of these dynamic factors and create a more robust and stable system in the end? So we'll start off with the first one. What is our physical setup? So to start off, we have the seven degree of freedom Kuko Iwa, as you can see over on the right hand side. And what we do to this to modify is weld on a rigid paddle end effector. Further, we have a ball as shown on the left hand side. This is what we use to simulate our environment. So here we can see our entire system diagram. This includes the manipulation station, which has the arm and the arm's internal controller the arm input and output ports, and then our external systems that do the different calculations for desired velocities and the differential inverse schematics and so on. This is shown over here and we can't really read this. So let's zoom in on this and take a closer look. So here in the bottom left, we see the output ports of the Kuka Iwa. This includes the position and the estimated velocity of the robot arm as well as other information about the simulation. Mainly the information about the simulation that we use shown up top is the ball pose and the ball velocity. Note that we are assuming that we have these exact values. We are taking them from the simulation data and not getting them through a perception system. The ball pose, ball velocity, and the different states of the EWA arm are passed into these two systems, which we will go more in depth, but essentially they take the ball velocity, ball pose, and the state of the arm to determine our desired translational and angular velocity of our paddle end effector. These are then passed into our differential inverse kinematic system to convert the desired paddle velocity into angular velocities of the robot joints. And then these are passed into an integrator to get joint angles, which are then looped back to close the system into the commanded robot arm EWA position. Now that we did an overview of our system, let's talk about how we perform this task of bouncing a ball. So the first thing we want to do is track the ball. Now, what does this mean? Well, let's think about the X, Y, and Z axis that we're operating on. In the X and Y axis, we want our pedal to follow as perfect as we can the X and Y position of the ball. However, in the Z direction, we want to do some sort of mirroring of the Z velocity of the ball so that when the ball goes up, our paddle goes down. And more importantly, when the ball is falling down, our paddle goes up to hit it back up into the air. So as our needs in the X and Y, and the Z axis are different, we will take two different approaches. For the X and Y axis, we use a first order dynamic control system using the current position and velocities of both the ball and the paddle. However, in the Z direction, we want to make sure we mirror the velocity. Now, what we tried initially was just doing a one-to-one -one negation. So the commanded velocity of the paddle is the negative velocity of the ball. However, this had two issues. The first is that at very high velocities, the ball would be moving fast, which would cause the paddle to move fast. When the paddle is moving fast, it hits the ball harder and makes the ball go faster, which in turn makes the paddle go faster and the system sort of loses control. The other issue is on the opposite side of the spectrum, where if the ball is losing kinetic energy and slowing down, so will the paddle and eventually the ball would just rest on the paddle. To fix both of these problems, instead of taking a linear negation of the ball Z velocity, we use a logarithmic velocity. Now, as you can see here on the graph on the right, the X axis is the magnitude of the ball Z velocity and the Y axis is the magnitude of the commanded paddle Z velocity. The curve in blue is a linear one-to-one -one 
and the curve in green is our logarithmic scale. And you can see at lower velocities here, our commanded velocity is higher than the one-to-one -to, -one to hopefully restore the kinetic energy in the ball and get it bouncing again. And as the velocity of the ball increases higher and higher, our tapers off here to make sure that it doesn't have a runaway effect of bouncing the ball higher and higher. Now that we talked about how to track the ball, we need to discuss how we keep the ball around a central point. That involves changing the angle of our paddle to bounce the ball back around to a central axis that we will refer to as the center. We model this using a bowl function around the central point that we want to bounce around that given an X and Y offset, we will be able to determine a desired angle of the paddle. So on the right here, you see on the red curve is our desired bowl shape. We use a sinusoid here because it has smoother behaviors around the extrema. Now the red curve is our bowl shape. However, what we find interesting is the angle of the paddle that we want. And so we can easily find this by just taking the inverse tangent of this bowl function divided by the offset, which is the x-axis here. And once we have that, we can say that that is our desired angle. And then we can use proportional control taking the error of our current angle of the paddle and the desired angle in each axis and commanding that as our angular velocity. Now, if we were in a low dynamic environment, we wouldn't really have any further issues after what we've discussed. But now, since we're in this dynamic environment, we have a few new specific scenarios that we need to address that are unique to juggling. So the first issue is related to the bowl-based orientation of the paddle. Like Ryan said, this is purely based off of the position of the ball relative to the central axis. But this doesn't take into account the velocity of the ball at all. So when the ball is moving back towards the central axis, we still have a tilt in the paddle that is propelling it further towards the axis. And as a result, we gain velocity and end up overshooting the reach of our arm. So over here to the right, we see an example of that. So it's rather subtle. But when we slow it down, we can see the small successive hits that propel the ball past that center line that's indicated by the gray vertical bar. Um, and a note on that, that bar there uh, is purely visual and only indicates where that center point is. So the way we correct for this is we compare the sign of the ball position and the ball velocity. If the signs are opposite, this means that the ball is moving back towards the central axis. And in this case, we wanna have a near zero tilt on the paddle. This way we minimize the amount of acceleration back towards the central axis and we no longer overshoot it. So as you see here, uh, you can see a little more when we slow it down, um, we're able to recover. Uh, and we no longer push the ball past this line, this vertical line beyond the reach of the, the um, paddle. So the other special case where we would want to limit the paddle's commanded Z velocity is when the offset of the ball from the center point gets larger. So as the X and Y values get farther away from that central point, the commanded angle of the paddle gets larger and larger, as we saw with the ball function. However, if the ball is bouncing fast, that will mean our paddle will be going fast. And if the paddle hits the ball at a fairly fast speed with an intense angle, it is very likely that it will hit it too hard laterally and that the ball's lateral velocity will be too fast for the paddle to catch it. And we can see an example of that here in this video. Let's slow this down, we can see it closer. So it tries to reach, it hits it fast and with an intense angle and it can't catch it. So how do we fix this? Well, we can scale our vertical commanded velocity of the paddle by the X and Y position of the ball offset from the center point. So basically as the ball gets farther from the center point, we want to scale down our commanded Z velocity to bring the ball back towards the center point. We do this with a radial function of one minus the x offset squared minus the y offset squared. So let's take a look at this. So it's softer, and then as it gets towards the center, it's, it's sort of subtle, but you can see it bounce a little higher. So now we've added some robustness to our translational tracker and our um, velocity mirroring, as well as our orientation on our paddle. Uh, so now we have a pretty stable system. And now we're gonna check out whether it's robust to different starting positions of the ball. So the first one we're gonna check out is the simplest case. This is where the ball starts along the central axis. In this case, there shouldn't be a whole lot of work going on for the paddle. And it should be stable for a very long time. As you can see here, there's very little uh, movement in the X and Y plane. Now let's look at a little more adversarial of a start. So here we have a Y offset. From our perspective in this video, the ball will start off to the right. So let's watch that and see what happens. 
So this is a small perturbation in the starting spot, but as you can see, the arm is able to catch it and bring it back to the center relatively stably. You notice some oscillation. That's expected, but given enough time, we think that this will eventually converge to the center line. So similarly, let's look at if we have a perturbation in the x-axis. So this is going farther away from the robot in the left direction we see here. So we should expect a similar performance that we just saw with the y perturbation. So let's see how this performs. So as you can see, it's able to grab the ball and bring it back to around the central point while bouncing it in control and fairly stably. And there is some oscillation, which again is expected. And we think given enough time, it could stabilize around the central point here. Finally, let's look at a perturbation in both the X and the Y direction. So when I start the video, you'll see the ball start to the right and then a little bit closer. It'll be hard to see because of the angle, but a little bit closer to us than the central point. So let's see how it does. So you can see, as expected, there is some oscillation around the central point, but it is able to hit it back and bring it around the central point fairly gently and in control. Right, so you might be wondering why we say that some of this oscillation is expected. This is because using that bowl function, the points towards the central axis when there is low offset, uh, we're not commanding much of a tilt at all. So if there's a little bit of lateral velocity in these cases, we're never gonna be correcting for it as long as the ball stays close to that axis. So there's always gonna be a very small amount of oscillation, uh, but just to give you a little insight and wrap things up, here's a little uh, blooper of what we've been dealing with in this dynamic environment. All right, so given that Drake isn't necessarily meant to simulate environments like this, there's all these abnormalities that we face going through it. But regardless, we think that we're able to create a rather stable system in terms of juggling a ball about an axis, as well as one robust to differences in starting position. And to wrap this presentation up, I will leave you with this video of it bouncing fairly stably. We wanted to say thank you to the 6881 course staff and a special thanks to Terry who helped us out a ton through this project. This was a very interesting project. It was really exciting when it started to work. It was frustrating when it wasn't. And I think we both learned a lot and got a lot out of it. We're both very proud of this project. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you.